So you were saying uh, that you were glad that the episode's going to air on the 13th of September. I am. You know, with life having so many tragic moments, it seems sometimes, um, the idea that something good could happen on a day where something really bad happened in the past just brings me some comfort. Yeah. Yeah. So talk a little bit about September 13th and what that means to you. So my mom kept a calendar and she wrote everything in this. There were free calendars that I think came from a, you know, a grocery store. And she wrote the money that she spent, the money that was left. And, and there were two days in all of her calendars. I have 66, 67, 68. There were only two days that were circled. And one was September 13th. And it said, Larry got orders, got his orders. And then the other was the day that my dad left for Vietnam. Mm. Mm. Yeah. Um, well, why don't we, why don't we start with just a little bit about your dad? Um, okay. uh, you know, tell us a little bit about him and, and, you know, where he grew up and, and how he grew up and, and what you know of, of, you know, what, what he was like as a young man okay. prior to, prior to, to going into the military. Okay. So what I've been told is that my dad grew up in a small area of Marion called Home Corner. So Marion, Indiana is a fairly small uh, town south of, in, north of Indianapolis, north of Indianapolis, Indiana. And so I currently still live in the same town where my dad was born. And part of that is because my mom lives here and I feel a very strong responsibility to her her care uh, and, and to her um, to her well-being, to be honest. Also, living here has connected me to places where my dad lived and walked and, and went to school. So I can currently, within five minutes from where I work uh, at a university called Indiana Wesleyan University, I can drive to the house where my dad grew up. And just parking my car and sitting in front of that house and just thinking about what might have gone on inside of it connects me to my dad. My dad's uh, grave is within 10 minutes from where I currently work. Uh, the house where my mom and I lived when he was in Vietnam, all very close by. I am a licensed clinical social worker. So I had the opportunity to go into a school that I know he attended and help kids like my dad. My dad grew up uh, with a single mom, uh, not having any male role models in his life, not having any father figures in his life grew up in generational poverty. Uh, and I helped those kids in the school setting. And I would walk up the banister and I would, I would kind of touch the rail. This is way before COVID and you weren't really thinking about what you were touching or I wasn't. And just the thought that my dad walked these halls, my dad touched this banister, assuming, I mean, it's a pretty old school, assuming it's still the same one. All of those things were needed within my soul to connect me to him. What I know about him, um, every, every single person, talks about the smile on his face, that even though he grew up in difficult circumstances, he had a positive outlook, uh, a cheerful disposition, uh, very kind, very smart, uh, pretty fast paced, pretty driven, uh, very smart. School That's came true. easy to him. Yeah, school came, yeah, school came easy to him. His, his sister will say uh, his that she had to study hard, that but that grades came very easy to my dad mm, mm -hmm. and and uh what year did he graduate high school 1964 from marion high school which is literally i could walk there it's it's five minutes from where i currently am so you must have known growing up you must have known adults who knew your father you yes you would think so but honestly most of them were only within our family I did not get connected to the people he went to school with until much later in life, actually in my adulthood. So growing up, my mom was really the source of information about my dad. Um, I knew he went to Marion High School, but I went to a county school called Oak Hill. So I didn't go to the school he attended. I truthfully did not know anybody that had served in Vietnam or really who grew up with my dad until really my adult years, mm -hmm. except for family members. Yeah. So he graduated high school in 1964. Um, 
did he go straight into the military? No. Um, and that story is is so shocking, to be honest with you. So the story passed down to me by my mother is uh, that my dad wanted to go to college after high school, but he didn't have the money to do so. And so he lived with his sister, Mana, and worked at a factory to save money for college and then thought that he was going uh, actually was accepted to Ball State University, paid his $10 deposit. And I know all of this to be true because my mom not only told me stories, she saved honestly everything that my dad ever touched in terms of artifacts. So I have this, it looks like a box that I think cologne came in uh, and it's my dad's box. And inside of it, is the paper from Ball State, his acceptance letter from Ball State, his deposits, you know, the, the receipt showing he paid his deposit. However, uh, a draft notice came in the mail, December of 1966. And my mom's story that is confirmed by others is that my dad was shocked to receive that draft notice because he thought he was going to Ball State. He wanted to be a medical doctor and had saved enough money, had it in the bank, it was just waiting. Ball State's on quarters. It's actually the university where I graduated from, or it was on quarters back then when I attended and when my dad was planning to go. And so he was going to, to join um, or start in, in, the, in one of the quarters in, in 1966. I, I need to correct something. Uh, his draft notice would have come December of 65 because he was planning to go to Ball State in 1966. And when the draft notice came, he was shocked because... He had given his mom $35 that was owed another admissions deposit, and she never took it to Ball State, um, as she had told him that she did, as, as he entrusted her to do. And he thought there had to be some sort of a mistake. And so he went to the draft. He, he wrote it, the letter to the draft board asking them to, to correct that and, and to give him that college deferment, and they denied that. I tell you that story because as I grew up hearing that story from my mom, I never doubted that anything my mom's ever told me is true. I just found that story hard to believe, to be honest with you. Um, and in 1995, I met Dr. Jerry Behrens, who was the battalion surgeon. He was the battalion surgeon of the Marines in Vietnam. And my dad, as a Navy corpsman, served under Jerry and was with him at the BAS for about a week. And in that short time, my dad told Jerry that story. And mm. so in 1995, when I found Jerry and he told me that story, I knew that every word of that story was true. So, I mean, without without placing blame, because I don't think that's useful, um, it, if that $35 had found its way to Ball State, your dad would have been deferred? He would have had a college deferment. Absolutely. Yeah. However... What my mom likes to say is that then he would have never met her. They would have never fallen in love. And I would not be sitting here today, probably. I, so mean, he, there's, I mean, there's a chance, I guess, they could have met if he was at Ball State, but it, it totally changes the direction of, of their lives. Yeah, yeah. So he got his draft notice. And when did he, when did he have to report? Yeah, so he was supposed to report January 20th, 1966, which is my mother's birthday but they had yet to meet. And so he enlisted in the Navy. His biological father served in the Navy. And he, if I understand correctly, uh, was told that he could get his medical training by being a Navy corpsman mm -hmm. and then would have money to go to school, right? After, after he got home from Vietnam. And so my dad enlisted in the Navy and he had a 90 day layover. And during that time, he, he quit the factory and started working for his aunt and uncle at a bowling alley in a little town called Gas City, Indiana, not very far from here. My mother worked there at a bank and she was in a bowling league. And so there were three weeks that my dad was working there. And during that three week period, they met. So, wow. So in between finding out that he'd been, uh, in between finding out that he'd been drafted, enlisting in the Navy, but prior to to having to show up yeah. for basic training in that in that little window he met your mother correct, correct. march uh, of 1966 was their first 
date. It's on that calendar. She's told me all about it, where they went. Just the other day, I had my mom in the car in Gas City uh, to get her hair done. And she then again tells me the story, which I, I could hear it over and over of their first date. And, and we drove right past the school where he took her to to see the women's globetrotters or the Harlem globetrotters, some, some sort of basket, basketball basketball. Uh, group. My dad loved sports. Well, it's but, Indiana after all, right? I mean, well, that's right. Basketball is kind of important there. That's true. <laughs> um, but the story that, that my mom shared with me, and it's so, it's just so interesting. As I wrote this book, every story she told me became verified by pieces of paper I would find. And so the story about their meeting is that she was bowling in this league after work, and he was working for his cousin, Ronnie. His cousin, Ronnie's whose parents owned the bowling alley, was not getting very good grades. So my dad said he'd, he'd work for Ronnie so Ronnie could study. So he comes over to take the uh, drink order from everyone that was in that little bowling group of my mom's. And as he walked away, a lady by the name of Dorothy Winter says to my mother, do you know he likes you? And my mom was oblivious. She actually had a boyfriend at the time. And so when my dad came back, he said to her, you know, I don't have a lot of time. I'm, I'm going to be leaving for the Navy or for boot camp. But uh, if you'd like to improve your game, I can give you some bowling lessons. And that's how it all began. Bowling lessons. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. And she yeah. wasn't uh, insulted at the uh, implication that her game needed improving? <laughs> I think she knew it did. But <laughs> the really amazing part to me is she went home and broke up with her boyfriend that night. I don't know what it was about my dad that captivated her, but they were inseparable. After that time, he did leave for boot camp. Uh, he graduated from boot camp uh, in July of 66, right near his his birthday. And, and where, so did they, she, where did they send him? Great Lakes, probably? Yes, they did. Yeah. Yeah. So she and his sister went, went to that graduation. And I have this video of my dad and mom having this incredibly beautiful kiss standing by the car at his boot camp graduation. I mean, their love is just so documented. And what a gift to me. Mm. Mm. So after he graduated from boot camp, uh, yeah. what happened then? So uh, he proposed pretty quickly. He had enough money for a ring. So I've got to get the date straight in my head. Uh, July 13th, her calendar says Larry proposed. And then July 14th, it says got engaged. And the way that that happened is that my dad got down on one knee and proposed. And then the next day, he and she went and picked out the ring, a ring that I currently still wear every day. How about that? Yeah. Wow. Uh, sorry, just for the record, what is your mother's name? Martha. Martha. My dad called her Marty. Marty. Got it. So they get engaged. Uh, they set a date, presumably. They did. October 8th, 1966. Okay. And it coincided with my dad's leave from core school. Gotcha. Yeah. So he was able to get that job that he wanted to become, uh, you know, to, to work in medicine. That's correct. Mom said he did pharmaceutical and podiatry both and loved both of them and thought that he would do one or one of the two uh, when he got home. And so whenever I would go to a podiatrist or take my children to a podiatrist, I would think my dad would probably have been that or or I, do, I feel the same way when I see a pharmacist. Yeah. So they're planning to get married in October. Your father yeah. received orders in September. So it's the following September, and that's why oh, these dates. And I, so, you know what? I, I I wrote this book for six years. You think I'd have all these dates straight? So they got married October of nineteen sixty six, October eighth of nineteen sixty six. He received orders. Hold on, I'm sorry. We might have to redo this whole interview. Um, I guess all that must have been nineteen sixty five. That that doesn't even sound right to me. I'm sorry. Can we, can you, can you edit this part out? Yeah, of course. Okay. I got to, let me just do some real hard thinking. He graduated from Marin high school in 1964. For sure. It's all in the book. Um, they got married October of 66, for sure. 
That can't be right. Why am I confused? I apologize that I'm confused. I was born in July of 67. Oh, I know. I know why. Because I was born when all that happened. Yeah. So I, I, every date I've given you so, so far is fine. So if you ask that question, I'll get back on track. They got married October 8th of 1966. Okay. I was born July 25th of 1967. And he received his order September 13th of 1967. Okay. Okay. Yeah. We're so that, that, that lines up. So, um, yeah, I mean, at this point, you know, he's got a wife, he's got a baby, he's got a job in the Navy that he likes, you know, yeah, he's I getting like trained it. to do something that he, that he will enjoy as a career. Uh, and, you know, just sort of hoping that, that his number doesn't get pulled for, for Vietnam. Correct. And then in September, he gets the bad news. Um, so you're three months old. Not even two. Not even two. Well, July to September. Yeah, you're right. You're right. Not even two, two, two months old. Yeah. Uh, I mean, I just can't imagine what that was like for him and, and for your mom also. Right. Uh, My mom describes that period. She said that he would, he would go to the work at the hospital every day, loved his job. He would come home to their little, they, they rented an apartment in a house. I'm getting ready to go there, by the way, on Sunday, I'm going to go see this house for the first time. Where were they living? Uh, uh, North Chicago. Okay. Uh, and mom said he would come home, kiss her, kiss her every, you know, walk in the door and give her a kiss. You know, they're, they're, they, they would come home back to Marion so that um, family could see me. They load up their little VW bug and come back home. But, but, but as I, they had this beautiful year together. They got married almost. So they got married October 8th and then his orders were September. So they had 11 months of, of this beautiful time with just the two of them. And, you know, my dad writes about what it was like to be a dad. And, and, and so this, he experienced so much in this short amount of time. And then those orders came and he had a really fast, uh, hard decision to make. And that was what to do with my mom and I, he wasn't going to leave us in Chicago and so mom said he had a decision that he could either go straight to field medical school and then have 30 days at home before going to Vietnam, or he could go from field medical school to Vietnam. He chose to have that 30 day break in between. And so within two weeks, he um, actually called his biological father who started being a part of his life uh, when he married my mom and he helped move us back home. And my dad was so forward thinking. Uh, he, he knew that the probability of him coming home, that there was a chance it wasn't going to happen. And so he asked his aunt Marge Cummings and uncle Russ, if we could rent an apartment above their garage, they had a, a ranch house right here in Marion. They had the most resources of anybody in his family. And they just had like a bonus room above the garage that had a pool table in it. And so Uncle Russ said yes. And I believe for $30 a month, he rented that apartment to my mom and dad. Dad got us moved in. And then he left for field medical school. And the beautiful thing is he wrote, he wrote to my mom through all of this. I have his letters from boot camp, his letters from field medical school. You know, his, and, and, in, and in all of that, he just talks about his love for her and his love for me. And so, so I know today that that is the best place we could have been when he was missing in action for 21 days. My Aunt Marge is 94 years old. And the bond that she and my mom share is just incredible. She was she was the person uh, to support my mom and to help take care of me during those terrible, terrible years. I mean, it was a year, but awful. Yeah. So how long was field medical school? So it was a, a month. Um, he, he left. Uh, I wish I would have all my mom's calendars right in front of me, but if you... If he left i'll just it's right here in the book let me just pull it up for you it was it was about a month though about a month yeah it's, that's close enough yeah okay. we don't have to yeah okay so, is that okay yeah so he was away at field medical school for you know a month give or take and then he comes home he's got 30 days that's right uh what does your mom say about that 30 day that 30 day break yeah. my mom said that they made the most of every moment they had their little apartment above the garage and uh, she scheduled our first 
professional photograph or family photo together. Uh, they, they went and played cards with friends. Uh, somewhere in this time, my dad sold his motorcycle. Um, according to my mom, they just lived like a year's worth of life in that, in that 30 days. They celebrated Christmas, December 14th, uh, right before he left. Mm. So he got to Vietnam sometime in December? Yeah, I believe it was December 24th. Oh, man. So um, yeah. Yeah, and this is right before the Tet Offensive. Yeah. Yeah, as I listened to uh, to your most recent podcast uh, this morning, there was mention of the Tet Offensive, and I didn't understand the significance of that until I did all this research for the book. I just didn't, I just didn't understand that my dad was really there at the most deadly time. Mm -hmm. Yeah. If you, uh, I mean, you've been to the wall, right? So you know how it's laid out and how it's organized. It is, it is astounding to think of how much of that wall is 1968. Yeah. Yes. Um, Yeah, if it's okay, I think, you know, at this point, it would be useful. I don't want to dwell on it, but I think it would be useful for you to explain what happened to your father in Vietnam. And then we'll, and then we'll, we'll kind of pick up with your story after that. That's fine. Yeah, that's great. I love talking about my dad's story. Uh, so my dad, you know, this is the part I wrestled with is if he wouldn't have been the senior corpsman of Kilo 3-9, would he have made it home? I'll never know. But my mom talks about um, my dad was so driven and so determined, and he would have her time him as he held his breath underwater and and hold his his feet while he did setups. He was he wanted to improve in rank so that there was more money for his young family uh, because they really you know they really kind of struggled even to get by. And so my dad arrived uh, in Vietnam higher in rank than a lot of corpsmen, and so he was an HM two and the senior corpsman of Kilo 3-9. Uh, he is the only corpsman that died on Valentine's Day, 1968 on Valentine's Ridge. So I really struggled with that. Why did these other corpsmen make it home? It, you know, I, I just, why did he not? And so what I, what I came to find out after interviewing 29 Vietnam veterans, several of whom were there, is that uh, on February 14th, uh, they left Kalu on a mission to go find out where the mortar was or multiple mortars that were being fired at them into the Kalu combat base. And they found uh, the North Vietnamese army up on that ridge. And uh, the captain and the lieutenant both became unable to, to lead. Uh, the captain was mortally wounded, died two days later. Uh, and when I say, when I say Lieutenant, I mean the, I mean the XO and the CO. So the, um, the Lieutenant couldn't give orders either. And there was really mass confusion. Uh, there were three other Lieutenants on that ridge, Lieutenant of 1st Platoon, 2nd Platoon, 3rd Platoon. Uh, there was also a weapons platoon there and uh, a lot of, a lot of chaos. And in the midst of that, uh, my dad was treating Marines that were wounded. Um, prior to the captain uh, and, and lieutenant being unable to lead, there was um, a man by the name of Cameron Carter who lives in Illinois. And Cameron had his arm shot uh, a couple, uh, his arm was shot enough that he was, he was wounded pretty bad. And so a man by the name of Marty Russell, Doc Marty Russell, who was the corpsman for third platoon and Cameron was in third platoon, went up to treat Cameron. And my dad came up from the rear where the CP group was and actually helped Marty Russell save Cameron Carter's life. Then is then the, the captain uh, and C, the XO and CO were, were wounded and some men just got off the ridge and some helped the wounded and some didn't know what to do. Some ended up spending the night all night long there. But my dad, we know, responded to the call of Corman up by a man 
named Frederick, I don't know who made the call, but a man by the name of Frederick Bungartz was injured. And I don't know who uh, called for help, but my dad responded and was uh, hit by two grenades. And according to the person that gave that missing in action report information, uh, no signs of life were found after that. Hmm. Yeah. And, you know, for me, the most, I mean, maybe for you as well, I'm sure the most difficult part of the story is, um, there's a, (laughs) there's a, there's a considerable gap, considerable gap between what was happening on that ridge and what was being communicated to your mother back home. Uh, Yes. Yes, sir. Yeah, that's that's a hard part still. Yeah. So what was uh, talk about that? The first uh, telegram. Okay. That your mother. Um, So my mother said that she was upstairs in our apartment and that she never picked up the landline telephone, which belonged to Marge and Russ ever. But the phone call, the, the phone rang. And for some reason, she picked it up. She still says she doesn't know why. And on the other line, she heard uh, Harry Goss, my dad's father, telling my uncle Russ that my dad was missing. The reason that Harry got the information first is that my dad's half brother worked on the Indianapolis Police Department. And so it came across to him first and he called his dad and said, call uncle Russ, you know, so that so that he's prepared when when Marty gets the news. And so my mom got the news that way. She said that she screamed, dropped the phone, and that I started crying. Um, That's how my mom found out that my dad was missing in action. And then, uh, you know, two men in uniform came to the door, she said later that day, to give her the news that he was missing in action. The first telegram indicated that my dad might have been taken by hostile forces. And so I really grew up believing that was true, wishing that was true, and thinking my dad was going to come home, which I think complicated my grief. Um, For 21 days, we know that my dad and nine Marines laid on Valentine's Ridge, their bodies decaying away, and the Marines that I have found said that they wanted desperately to go retrieve those bodies. But for various reasons, they were not allowed to. Finally, on March the 5th, they were uh, a a recon team named Delmar uh, was ordered to go retrieve the remains. And so my dad's remains were, uh, they were found and whatever was left of them, which couldn't have been much, uh, were brought back down on March the 6th from that ridge and shipped back to the Indianapolis airport, the place where my dad left uh, here in December. My mom documented those days in the most heart-wrenching letter to my dad, which is in the book. I don't know how she did it. She's, she's clearly very strong, um, but she kept praying that God would l- help them find Larry. It, the, the telegram actually said that a search team was looking for my dad. None of that is accurate, but I wanna be very, very respectful. And, and I, I spent, hours agonizing on what to put in the book and what to leave out because I really love our country and I really believe in our military and I and I know that without a body that's probably what they had to say and so I don't have any any negative feelings about that I just know that my mom suffered unnecessary pain and suffering and not just her I have found several of the family members of those nine marines that were also there on that ridge for 21 days and And I've been able to help them know what really happened because they had those same telegrams and they had that same hope and they had that same belief that when all the POWs came off that airplane, when the war finally ended, that their loved one was going to walk off the plane too. I'll never forget my mom watching that telegram to that television. I'll never forget what it felt like when we knew that my dad was not walking off that plane. And Frederick Bungartz's brother told me that his mother literally 
was in front of the TV crying out to God to please let Frederick walk off the plane too. Yeah, and, and all of that's in the book. I, the things I found out in, in doing the research for this book, it, it just taught me what I, that, that what we lived, many families lived. We just didn't know about it. Nobody was talking about it. Nobody was reaching out to us and saying, hey, Gold Star family member, please come to this camp so Lori can learn how to live without her dad. There was nothing for us. There, there, you know, nobody in my school had a dad in Vietnam. And so I just really believe that Gold Star children of the Vietnam War have had to really walk this journey pretty alone, at least until Sons and Daughters in Touch came about and we were able to find each other and realize that our stories weren't that different. Yeah. Lori, if we could, I'm sorry to, I really don't want to dwell on this, but I feel like there, we we need to clarify a, a, a couple of things for just for the listeners, right? So it's understandable that until they retrieved the body, they yeah. presumably they had to list him as missing in action because he can't be Correct. confirmed killed in action until until there's a body. Correct. So that explains that part of it. It does not explain why they would tell you that there's a possibility he had been captured. Yeah. Uh, and all those other families as well. And then the second thing that we need to clarify is people, I mean, when the POWs were released, that was years later. I believe it was five. So how in the world did these other families or, 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 you know, maybe yours as well, how in the world could they allow these? I mean, you said the, the bodies were retrieved in March, March 5th. Yes, March 6th. So, yes. March so, 6th. So, five years later, the POWs. So, all those families, even though the bodies had retri been retrieved on March 5th, all those families still held out hope five years later when they're watching the POWs get off the plane? It's a great question. So, in, in doing the research, and I have to tell you, a, a Marine by the name of James Lockwood, who was in India Company, and he was sent up the following day to help bring the, the wounded Marines back off that ridge. He he helped me look at all this objectively. I had to have somebody. My, my son said, mom, you've got to find a historian. You've got to find somebody that can help you sort through all of these accounts that I have from the men who survived the battle. And, and what I learned in doing that and what Jim helped me to understand is that five of them were listed as MIA. I'm not, I'm sorry. Five of them were listed as KIA, body not recovered. Five of them were listed as MIA. And so what I have come to understand is that the men were killed on February 14th. About 30 Marines spent the night on the ridge, led by Lieutenant Dan Wazolik and a man by the name of Captain Conger, who recently passed away, who received, I believe, a silver star for his heroic actions. He actually came in on a helicopter, dropped down on a rope, he and Dan was all like together the next morning led, they, they, they took those, you know, we have, we have 10 men up there that are dead. We have 30 up there that are alive, led those men up the hill and took the hill and the MVA left. That's on the 15th. My understanding is that a helicopter came in to, to pick up the dead and it was shot down. And that on the 15th, when Captain Conger and Lieutenant Dan Wazolik asked for help to bring the wounded, everybody but one person, it's my understanding, was wounded on the 15th and that assault up the ridge, that, that they asked for India Company to come help them and that only one platoon from India Company was sent, not the full battalion. And so they could only bring back the wounded. Somewhere in the midst of that, on the 14th or 15th, five of those dog tag numbers were called in. Don Carter, who was uh, up there, he, he personally remembers calling in two of them. So, so for five of the families, they knew KIA, body not recovered. But for the other five, for, for whatever reason, we still don't know why if they, you know, I, my dad and, uh, so, so what we do know is when Delmar went up to find the remains on March the 5th, they found seven and then they found three more. So, so if, if you look in the book, it talks about the report is that they found the five KIAs and part of the MIAs. And then the next day they found the rest of the MIAs. For those five families, 
I believe that they, they lived what we lived because my mom was highly advised to not open up the casket, okay? Um, Frederick Bungart's family told me that, that their dad made the decision that their uncle could open the casket and view the remains and that the smell of formaldehyde was so strong that he couldn't look for very long. But he did say to the family that, that he, could, he could tell that it was Frederick or, or thought that it was and that there was a chest wound. So, so for that family, they had that information and the mother still sat by the television hoping Frederick would walk off the plane because accepting something like that is so hard to do, right? That her son, right? That my mom's husband really were in a casket, unrecognizable for the most part. I, the, the, it's hard for the brain to wrap itself around that. And so I think humans hang on to hope. I think it helps them not have to swallow all of the bitterness of grief at one time. Yeah, and I think you, you know, if there's any room for doubt, right? Because the what's in the casket is unrecognizable. You That's feel right. like you need to throw all of yourself into that that little crack where doubt might be because to do otherwise is somehow a betrayal of the person, right? Like, I just can imagine not, if I can find any shred of any sliver of a reason to hang on to hope, I'm probably gonna do that because I feel like if I don't, uh, I'm gonna have to, I'm gonna have to explain that someday to the person when they come back. Yeah, I, you know, I, yeah, I think that's right. I also think that that grief, grief, grief is so difficult. I just believe grieving is the most difficult task humans have to face. And so, when I was studying to be a, a, a therapist, a licensed clinical social worker, I remember my my supervisor Ed Pereira saying to me that grief is like a sheet cake made up of the nastiest ingredients you can imagine. And and your task in grieving is just to take one bite at a time. And so I think for my mom, this hope that my dad was coming back to her helped her grieve a little bit at a time and not have to eat the whole cake all at once. Amazing. Okay, so, uh... You know, I've talked to other guests who've who've been in a similar situation, right? Uh, the mom and the kids at home, uh, in some cases, multiple kids, um, and then they find out that uh, the father's not coming home from Vietnam. Yeah, and suddenly they have to move out of, I mean, you weren't in military housing, but they suddenly have to move out of military housing and they're just no longer affiliated with the military. Um, yeah. what was that like for you and your mother? Um, because even though you weren't living in military housing, you were, you were a military family. Yeah. Um, what does your mom say about that separation? Yeah. I appreciate that question. You know, that's a story that I didn't hear until I started writing the book. I, I really truly didn't know all of that, but my mom's story is that around October of 1968, my dad was killed February, Valentine's Day, 68. He was missing in action for 21 days, buried at the end of March. So now we're looking at October. So seven months later, um, she said she felt like she had outwore her welcome at Aunt Marge and Russ's house. And that their daughter talked about a house that was for rent. And mom, mom kind of saw that as their way of saying it was, you know, maybe they wanted their house back. You know, maybe they wanted us to move. And so mom rented that house. But, but here's what I know about my mother. She hates being alone. She's actually, she actually avoids being alone as much as she possibly can. And she was scared. And so she describes this time of her and I living by ourselves. My dad's cousin did live next door. That's the cousin that told her about the house. And she would have her sisters over a lot uh, just to keep 
her company, maybe to keep her from having to experience all that emotion to, to really think about the loss and the grief. And, and she has this baby. Um, I'm at this point, 15 months old. And so she, uh, she then had a birthday. We moved out in October into our own little place. She had a birthday in, in January. And she talks about driving uh, to see my dad at his grave that day. It was snowy. Um, her mom had a party for her, but she just wanted my dad. And so, so I know from my mom, it was her and I living in this apartment and her really not knowing what she was going to do with her life. Um, how old we were not, this point? how old is Marty at this point? At uh, 23, I believe. Oh, good God. Maybe 24. If I could open my book, 23 or 24. Mm -hmm. Um, Yeah. Um, so what did she do? Um, she talks to me about, um, having a shrine set up for my dad in her home. Uh, she talks to me about taking me to the cemetery often. Um, I have pictures of me there, um, at every every age of my life. Uh, I think she just held on to him and just kept loving him. And, and I think she poured all her love for him into me and uh, making sure that she passed his legacy on so that in, in her own mind, uh, he really didn't have to die. I think I was this living, breathing piece of him that she devoted her life to as a way of showing him, I think, how much she loved him and still does to this day. She reads this book every night. She reads this book. Um, she says to me, uh, she said to me recently, Lori, um, no one knows how hard this is for me to relive it again. But she wants to, right? She loves that the book's here. She can't believe it's here. But to reread my dad's letters, he loved her so much and to be that young to be 21 and and you know and 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 just fall in love and so the those memories continue to carry her through her days at the age of 76 hmm. so i i just want to do a quick time check because we're at an hour and I feel yeah. like we've got another hour to go. So uh, are I you, have plenty of time, but do you? Are you good? Yeah, I'm good. Yeah, I, and I have I don't no even, higher priority than you. You must be really good at this. I, I can talk about my dad without crying like most of the time. I don't know what's going on today. This is not my norm. <laughs> yeah, uh, I don't think it's me. I think it's, uh, I don't know. I don't know what it is. I I, I don't know what it is. I don't, I don't think I'm, you know, I don't think I'm Barbara Walters, but people, <laughs> but when I do these things, people, people, uh, people are often overcome. Um, okay. And I'm often overcome. Um, so was it, was, was Marty working during this time? I mean, she's got a 15 month old. She's just moved out into a new apartment. How's she getting by? Yeah. Um, my mom had my dad's um, life insurance, $10,000. And um, my dad's father borrowed some of it, um, but my mom used the rest of it for us to live and she was not working at the time. Mm. Um, and then later, um, not much later, she ends up... Um, finding someone mm. and they together um had a child mm. and so she married him yeah and so you grew up with that with that uh um they divorced family. when i was four and mm. i did grow up with that half brother um and so when they divorced uh, my mom was a single mom raising my half brother and i and at that point she worked at kmart and uh in the evenings and she used some of my dad's life insurance to buy us a house. Mm. And we moved, well, first we moved to an apartment near my maternal grandma. And then she bought us a house in that same town called Fairmount, Indiana. 
And so my best childhood memories are there. Uh, apartment C was our little apartment that we first moved to, and then our house on Second Street. And my mom was an incredible single mom, but she had a lot of guilt about leaving us with babysitters or not finding good babysitters. And, and those period, that period was harder for her than I realized. Uh, for, for, for my brother and I, it just felt pretty carefree. We had a sweet elderly lady next door that would babysit for us sometimes. And I remember like we had a sofa that had like a, a bed, like a sleeper. And so we would hide in there. My mom would get home at 11 p.m. and we'd, you know, pop out and surprise her. And uh, then there was a, a point where she babysat. And so my friends would come after school that she babysat for. And she'd have these little hostess cupcakes for us and drinks. And, and she, it was just, it, those are the best memories that I personally have. Um, but my mother um, will tell you that she couldn't give me a dad. And so she couldn't take my half-brother's dad away. And so she remarried him when I was 10. Mm. And, they're, and they're still married today. Still married today? They are. Wow, that's amazing. So, you know, sometimes an absence can be as it can have the same kind of gravity, you know, the same kind of power to define an experience as a presence. Yeah. Um, you know, if you can, if you can think back to before you started researching the book and before you started to find out, you know, all the missing pieces of your family history and just remember what it was like to grow up. How did your father's absence mm -hmm. define your experience? You know, I, it's, memory is interesting when you're a child and, and, and the vivid memories that I have um, are not of going to the grave. I, we have pictures of that. Uh, I don't really truthfully remember that. Uh, what I remember is going to school for the first time and being afraid that something was going to happen to my mom while I was there. I actually love school. I've spent my life uh, in school, uh, ended up getting a doctorate and I teach. I mean, I, I played school when I was a child, loved school. But that separation from my mom was really difficult for me because in my mind, she was all I had. Uh, my mom's mother, very significant uh, person in my life, but she had her own children to raise, right? She, I have an aunt that's six years younger than me. So my mamma was still raising my aunt, uh, Rhonda and Sandra, and, and she had other children too uh, that were older. So for me, if something happened to my mom, I didn't know what was going to happen to my, to my brother and I. And so kindergarten, that's my big memory. Um, and even a little bit before that, my dad's grandma Bradford, his maternal grandma, loved me uh, because she loved my dad. And so my mom did stay connected to her, not as much with my dad's family, but, but definitely with her. So I remember being about four and going to Grandma Bradford's house. And she would, you know, call me Lori Joe because my dad was her Larry Joe. And so, so there were pieces of him in my visits with Grandma Bradford. Um, but I remember this lump in my throat at nighttime. And laying in Grandpa, Grandma Bradford's feather feather bed, and 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 wondering if my mom was okay and missing my mom, and so so my dad's absence for me created, I believe, a lack of security, uh, maybe some abandonment that manifested itself in some anxiety about what would happen to my mom when when I was away from her. Thankfully, uh, that got better with time. Um, first grade, however, it was still uh, a little bit of a challenge. Not, not that I thought she wasn't going to be okay while I was gone. I think I worked through that in kindergarten. But first grade, I think it's when kids start talking about, you know, like my dad's got big muscles and, you know, your dad, you know, we're talking about our dad. So what was I going to say when kids talked about their dad? I could tell them about my grandma. She was really strong. She worked at a factory and she had big muscles, but I didn't have a dad to talk about. And, and I think first grade's the first time I remember feeling like I'm really different. And especially on Valentine's Day, I'll never forget Valentine's Day party, my first grade year. And we're passing out Valentine's. And, I, and all I remember is I started to cry. And I, 
I also remember a little boy saying to me that I didn't have a dad. And I don't know if that was the same day. I mean, that's not enough clarity for me. But but the clear part is uh, I I was crying. And, and my teacher that whole year, you know, told my mom I should go see a counselor. You know, I, I didn't. But I, there was something going on that first grade year. And so uh, it was this the sense of what am I supposed to feel on Valentine's Day? Everybody seems to be happy and they're playing or they're passing out cards, but my dad died this day. What am I supposed to feel? Just connected because of the book with my best friend from a second grade. And she said to me, you know, Lori, I didn't know anything about your dad. We must have never talked about it. And you know, when I got her name's Shelly, and when I got Shelly's message just recently, I thought, good. Something must have happened after first grade that in second grade, I must have just got to be okay. And so second, third, and fourth grade, phenomenal years of my life because I had teachers that loved me. And so the self-worth that comes typically from your dad telling you, you know, you're valuable, you're beautiful, you're worthwhile. Mine came from teachers and my ability there to make friends easily and do well in school. And so um, I think all those voids that the absence of my father created got filled by, for me, uh, relationships and uh, doing well in school. Yeah. And in your your school age years, you never ran into any other Gold Star mm-hmm. kids? No. The very first person ever uh, I was already in high school. My cousin, my dad's cousin, Nancy Maddox, who has now passed away, said to me, hey, Lori, there's this person from my church, Lakeview Church. And her dad uh, was also killed in Vietnam. And so Nancy connected us. I don't remember anything super significant from that meeting, really. I just knew, okay, there's one other person like me. But honestly, I didn't think there were very many people like me. I I thought that most people in Vietnam were young, you know, what I learned in the history books, right? 18, 19 years old. And so I didn't think very many of them had children. I didn't think about that there were lieutenants and captains and and older people. I mean, no part of me thought that there were very many others. Um, And then I found out about Sons and Daughters in Touch. I believe it was 1992 or three. I, and I only think of the year because I know I had two babies at the time. And so I saw this magazine article that mentioned Sons and Daughters in Touch. And I thought, there are other people like me somewhere who also lost their dad in Vietnam. But but I didn't get involved. I, I just, uh, I didn't think I could travel to D.C. with two babies and and just decided that I'd, I'd figure that out someday. And so uh, I have since met many of them, but not at all when I was growing up. Mm. But you did take a trip to the wall in 1980. Yeah, I did. That was just so cool. And and cool because just just yesterday, you know, marketing this book is a lot of work. And so yeah. I've been relying on my friends and, and family or teachers or anybody really that might possibly care to share about Kiss Lori for me. This book that I hope gets in the hands of the people that need to read it. And so I sent it to a former teacher and she she sent me a message back and said, I'll think about it. Um, but I remember that day when you found your dad's name on the wall. I truly didn't even remember that teacher being in, in there, but 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 she must have been. And what I do remember is our principal uh, made sure that I got to go to the wall. It wasn't even planned on the itinerary. So I get this field trip uh, note from school. And I take it home and, and I let my mom know that they're going to DC. And so I have a stepbrother uh, and he also wanted to go. So my mom found a way to pay for uh, he and I to both go to the wall. And I still have the brochure, you know, it says Washington DC. And at the very top, I write my dad, cause he's always my dad. He was never anything but my dad for some mm-hmm. reason, mm-hmm. Uh, you know, panel 39, you know, and, and, I'm, I'm sure that I went to that little book and, and somebody told me that he's panel 39, you know, line 32. I mean, you think I'd have it memorized, but uh, I think it is 39, line 32, but I found it and did a rubbing and came back home. And this is, I mean, the amazing thing about this story is that your, your class trip 
was planned without the right. Vietnam Memo uh, Veterans uh, Memorial because it was it hadn't been built yet. And then just by chance, you happened to be there during the dedication. And yeah. so, your so, the so your principal added it to the itinerary for you. Well, it, but it's because of my mom. So thank, thankfully, my mother reached out to my principal, Larry Stoner. When she paid our deposit for my brother and I to go, she told him, you know, about my dad. Uh, and so he then added it to our itinerary before we got there because my mom had asked him to. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So it sounds like that trip was probably, I mean, if I, if I'm understanding you correctly, you know, the, the void in your life was filled by other things, by other people, other relationships, other pursuits. Uh, and so now you're in DC and you're standing at the wall. And is this the first time in a while that that has been such a, uh, a huge, uh, just a huge thing in your life? Yeah, you would think so. But there's one other thing that oh, we haven't talked about. And that is this memorial poem that I wrote. And so honestly, you know, I, I, I did get through elementary and I think, you know, well, I don't know. I mean, although I think I did okay and filled my void with other things, for some reason, my dad was always still a part of things because in fourth grade, again, doing research for this book, I find this piece of paper that my mom saved from fourth grade where I wrote an essay called My Wish. My fourth grade teacher, Mr. Geringer, only male teacher I had had, first male teacher I'd had, significant in my life. Uh, he had us write this essay called My Wish and I wrote about my dad and that my wish was that my dad could come home. And I say in there, my dad was a doctor and so he might've been captured. I'm a fourth grade little girl I don't know what a corpsman is. So I say my dad was a doctor. That, that was my understanding. I say in that um, essay that my dad's grandma and my mom really needed him and that my dad's grandma had cancer. And so if I had one wish, it would be that my dad came home. So honestly, because of my mom, I really think it's because of her. He was, he was still always a part of my thoughts. Um, you know, I guess I didn't talk to Shelly about my dad, but, but, for some reason, uh, in, you know, in fourth grade, I was, I was courageous, I guess, enough to write about it. Then when I was, I think, 14, maybe 13, I'd have to go back and look at the poems. Um, my mom came to me and said, you know, Lori, I, I, I want to make sure your dad is never forgotten. And you really like to write. I think you could write something or would you be willing to write something? Um, and we'll put it in the newspaper every year on Valentine's Day so people always remember him. I mean, what a task. Uh, I'm glad she asked me. I don't know how in the world at, at I think, 14, I even knew what to do. Um, but I love to write poems. And you know what I found out because of all of this research that my dad loved to write poems too. And so in writing this book, I knew I was like him. I knew I looked like him. I, I know my personality traits are very much like his, but, but boy, the fact that we both love poetry. So I wrote this poem uh, about Larry Joe Goss, my dad, and, and my mom put it, she paid to put it in the newspaper. And every year on Valentine's Day, she put it in the newspaper. And so I believe it was my sophomore year. So it would have been right after that Vietnam Wall experience. It would have been the following year. I think I don't ever want to tell you wrong about dates, but but a reporter read that in the newspaper and did an article about my dad. And I took a picture. I remember a picture, an eight by 10 of my dad to school. And I remember thinking like, oh, I finally get to take my dad to school. I was just so excited about that. Um, but then she wanted me to pose for a picture. So I have this picture of this probably 15 year old girl holding an eight by 10 of her dad and I'm not smiling. I think that was the real struggle. Is it okay to smile and be, what do you, how do you do that when you're talking about something so sad? However, uh, my dad had a lot of joy. And so I always knew I had to live for him. And so I somehow got pretty good at compartmentalizing and putting that sadness away and putting it in a drawer and, and just living life 
to the best of my ability for the both of us. So I really believe he's always been a part of my journey. Um, the yeah. wall was just the first time I ever remember my peers then kind of understanding it. The peers that were with me on that trip then had a different maybe a view of Lori without a dad, right? I was Lori who didn't have a dad, but that year I was Lori who had a dad that gave his life for our country. And that's a whole different perspective. Yeah. Yeah, I didn't want to interrupt you, but I have to say I was really, uh, one, one of the things you said that I find incredibly rich and poignant and moving and telling was what a big thing it was for you the first time you had a male teacher. Oh, so huge. I could talk about that for a whole nother episode. I can tell you, kindergarten teacher was lovely. First grade teacher was worried about me. Second grade teacher was so sweet. And uh, her husband was a pastor and he would come into our classroom. We had this little mobile classroom and he would make us, his name was Zen Harvey, and he would make us close our eyes so he could give Mrs. Harvey a kiss. And so for me, it was the first time I saw this loving, beautiful relationship. So that was significant in second grade. Third grade, for some reason, I became popular and had lots of friends and had a teacher that I thought was, was absolutely fine. And then fourth grade, I had Mr. Geringer. I don't know why. And he shouldn't probably have had favorites. But my best friend, Shelly Bothwell, Amy Jenkins, and I became what he called Mr. G's Angels after Charlie's Angels. I think he probably, I think he maybe knew well, maybe Shelly's family or something, but, but for whatever reason, he picked me too to be in this group that he truthfully seemed to favor. I hate to even say that out loud, but for this little girl who desperately needed her dad, it did something real significant for me because Mr. G highly valued me and it was always appropriate and it was fun. And he would pick me every time when he said the word Hawaii, because we'd have to tell the state capitals. So, you know, he'd, he'd say a state and kids would say the capital every time um, he would say Hawaii. I would stick my right index finger up in the air and I would go Honolulu and I would like how like it's not even my personality today. But in fourth grade, for whatever reason, Mr. G would laugh, the kids would laugh. And the other thing that happened is he always called me Joe. My name is Lori Joe, right after my dad. Every year on my school papers that year, I wrote Joe and he called me Joe. I, there's something kind of sweet about nicknames, mm -hmm. especially when given to us by a male that, that thinks we're pretty cool. Yeah. Yeah, I just think that's really telling because you you talk about, you know, how how the the void in your life had been filled. But I think your reaction to that relationship. Yeah. Um I don't know that it would have been the same if you hadn't on some level felt uh incomplete yeah and to be honest with you I, I i absolutely have been incomplete the void was filled but not really because really truthfully the void's still not feel, filled hmm. when i say the void was filled with friendships i was just trying to feel normal and because i was popular and i got good grades i felt like okay about myself but hmm. the truth is not having a dad present there's a void and that void's still here today. So let's talk about the book. Okay. Um, what, what triggered it? Because I mean, you're not a, uh, <laughs> you know, you're not a, you're not an author by profession. <laughs> I mean, you're clearly no. high, highly educated and highly capable of writing a really compelling book, but uh, you know, so, well, so are a lot of people who don't write books. Yeah. yeah. I don't know. I truly don't know. You know, Again, doing research for this book, I found this piece of paper, kind of lined paper, like you would use in school. And it said, my goals. 
and the writing, I, I really wish I would have put this in, in the book, but my writing was not my writing today. So I think I had to have been like junior high age, I, I'm guessing from the way my penmanship was. And it said, you know, get a memorial, get a monument for my dad in Grant County. Uh, write a book and get it published. It was was amongst this list of four or five goals. Specifically about your dad or just write a book? Yes. And get it published? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I think it said write a book about my dad and get it published. Mm. Um, I, I knew I knew I was going to write this book. And I think it's because for whatever reason. I am that person in our family. That could do it. Somebody had to do it. His memory deserved that. And growing up, um, I had those letters, his letters to my mom. And I really couldn't read them. They're really still pretty sad. I had these audio tapes that he sent to her from Vietnam. I haven't, they, I didn't have room for those. This book's actually so long. I didn't, I, I didn't even have room for them. But they sent each other back numerous audio tapes. When I was 18, I was accepted to Ball State University, just like my dad. And my mom paid a neighbor to take all those audio tapes and put them onto a cassette tape. And I remember... Because they were real to real before that? Yes, yeah. yes. And so I never got to hear them, right? Mm -hmm. I remember putting that cassette tape in my car. I bought uh, myself a little uh, tempo, a white tempo. And I'm driving to buy, yeah, I know. I was a lifeguard, saved my money, just like my dad. And I bought this car, not brand new. Um, so much like my dad. And I put that cassette tape in. And I heard my dad's voice for the first time. And I had to pull over and cry. I still cannot listen to his voice without crying. But what a gift his voice is to me. And honestly, I could give you line after line of his letters that say things that are profound. He was a 21-year-old man who said, war is hell. Men should see their children grow up. He said that in response to my dad's cousin's husband who had been drafted. And my dad saying he hoped Danny didn't have to come over to Vietnam. My dad in his letters would say, how's my darling daughter? In his letters would say, I'm sending these things home to go on a scrapbook for Lori someday. I hope you know she can take them to school, right? Uh, January 1st in his journal, um, Things are getting pretty interesting over here. I hope I can tell my grandchildren about it someday. My dad left nugget after nugget after nugget for us. I don't know if he did that because he thought he wasn't possibly going to come home or if he did it because I think it's just who he was. He was forward thinking. He was loving. He was kind. And he cared about breaking generational poverty and giving my mom and I a different life than what he experienced. And I think I knew that for my own children, and I mean, I'm, I'm a teenager, so I, don't, you know, I, I love babies. I knew I wanted to have a lot of babies. I think I knew for my family that I was at least going to put it in a book. I didn't think I was going to put it in a book for other people to read. That came way later. Um, but their love story, their legacy of love, I believe we need to hear. How, how do we love people better? Now, my dad did the ultimate. He laid down his life for a stranger. Most of us won't be called to do that, but we are called to love each other well. And my mom and dad did that in a way that I had to share it with the world. And I mean, once you, once you decided to write this book, um, that was the beginning of a whole other journey for you. Yeah. Yeah. I don't know why I thought, I know, I mean, this is, there's a couple of things. One is when I said that I thought nobody else in my family could do this, but me, that task was not really in the sense of writing the book. It was finding out what happened to my dad. Because when I grew up, his mother said to me, well, you know, Lori, your dad's not really buried, really buried at the IOF cemetery. 
and I, I wanted your mom to open the casket and she refused. And so I went to the funeral home and they opened the casket and there was nothing in there. She told me that on my 16th birthday. Who told you this? My dad's mom. Your dad's mom. Yeah. Um, my dad's grandma, you know, would say she didn't really believe that he was dead. And so I wasn't convinced that, that those pieces of paper that we had contained the story of what really happened to my dad. I mean, I read through them all, but there were so many missing pieces. I, I really believe I had to find out for him, for my mom, for myself, what really happened to him. And I never expected to find out what I found. Never. I mean, truthfully, we use the word hero a lot. My dad really was a hero, not because I want him to be, because of his character and who he was and what he chose to do on that battlefield. I, I say in the book, I didn't want a hero, I wanted a dad. That's really, really true. But in your episode with Captain Dale Dye, he talked about one of the lessons that he learned in Vietnam is that in combat, you get to see the full gamut of human behavior and you get to see the best of humans and the worst of humans. And in researching my dad's story, I found some things that were pretty painful to find out about choices made on the battlefield. And I chose to leave those out of the book. And I'm glad I did. But what I found out was that there were, there were some real heroes up there. And we have to honor them. We have to tell their stories. We have to listen to their stories. It was such a privilege for me to have these men who chose to open up their memories, their hearts to me, a, a corpsman's daughter. And, and I got caught up in this part where some of them wanted me to tell like, what really happened on that ridge? Come on, Laura, you've got to tell it, right? But can you imagine trying to put the accounts of all these men together and just trying to find the parts that, that matched up? And, 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 just, and, and just, I mean, I would hear their stories over and over and it was such an honor to hear their stories. And so to include their accounts in the book, they just kind of took on this whole other thing that I never intended to do, which was not only tell what happened to my dad, but to tell what happened to those men, some of whom chose to stay up there all night long and fight the next day. They didn't get a medal. Nobody debriefed them and asked them what happened. But they have stories. They have memories that are included. Um, Doc, uh, Lieutenant Dan Wazolik told me he went to many, I don't know, I don't want to say many. He went to Vietnam Veterans Reunions, never talked about Vietnam. For some reason, he chose to email me so many times. And I appreciate it so much, the amount of time he gave me um, and his accounts in the book. Uh, Jed Garton from platoon, first platoon, and, and all of first platoon volunteered to go retrieve the bodies on March the 6th. Delmar found them, but Delmar didn't bring them back off the ridge. And that's a whole nother story. But first platoon volunteered to do so. And Jed Gurton and a man by the name of Will, who ended up dying in Vietnam later, actually brought my dad's remains off that ridge. That, that has to be told. We have to understand that these men were young they faced really horrific decisions and they did some incredibly noble things. It is time we start listening to them. And, and I thank you for what you're doing to tell in telling their stories. This book is just a piece of that. I could write another book with their stories in it because you know what? I didn't get to have my physical dad, but I will spend the rest of the time I have on this earth honoring them. And, uh, you know, we tell them, thank you for your service a whole lot, a whole many years later, but you know what? We owe them a whole lot. And uh, I, I don't know, that's what this book became. It became much more than my dad's story. It became their story. And was that the biggest surprise for you in writing the book that the scope of it became so, so much broader than you intended? Uh, the biggest surprise was my that was that my dad died trying to save the life of a wounded marine. I had no idea. You had no idea. 
absolutely not. So in um, in 19, I have to get this straight, sorry. Um, in 2007, let me, let me, I'm going to back up again. I think thankfully you yeah, edited this. And Lori, we, we're, you know, we're going to edit this. So if you want to take a minute, you know. Okay. Uh, I'm okay. There's just so many dates and there's, right. Um, yeah, yeah. Let me give you this. I just want you to feel like you can take a breath when you, when you want. Yeah, to. I needed to on that one. Sorry. It's okay. okay. So, yeah. so when I was growing up, my mom would talk to me about, we need to find Stan Burkhart. Stan Burkhart is a man, a sweet man, a corpsman uh, who met my dad at boot camp and they became really good friends. And so I would think like, I don't know how to find Stan, right? How am I going to find Stan? So uh, thankfully through the internet, Stan found me. And so in talking to Stan, I got to hear a lot about my dad's personality stories about my dad's kindness to him in boot camp. Um, we could go on and on about that, but, but, but although I knew from Stan that my dad was loving and kind, um, Stan said that his shoestrings came untied when they were marching and that they had this officer, Officer Green, who, who picked my dad to be a master of arms, but for whatever reason, uh, Stan wasn't able to quite keep up. And so um, my dad then befriended Stan and tied his shoelaces uh, one day when they were marching, when they came untied, right? So I knew from Stan that my dad had this part of him that was just loving and kind. But I was told um, by some men who were there that my dad was killed instantly when the mortar came in. I was told that my dad, the XO and the CO were looking at a map and that the mortar landed on top of them, instantly killing all of them. I had no reason to think that that story wasn't what happened until a man by the name of Ray Felly, who's a corpsman, connected me to Doc, to Doc Marty Russell. So I had my youngest baby in 2000 and I have, you know, that's how I kind of equate dates in my brain. And that baby was young um, when I had the opportunity to, to have a conversation. Okay. I'm going to pause. I don't want to get dates wrong. I'm trying to think like, I, so we're going to pause on that one. Let me go to this. Let me go to this. Um, so I don't know how critical getting the dates exactly right is i mean i, I don't want to i don't want to do it i don't want to presume that for you but but i mean what we're trying to get to is um um you said that you had no idea that he died yep. saving somebody yeah so i'm going to forget the dates so i'm going to give you this um in 2007 i turned 40 and my husband to my surprise bought plane tickets for my 10 year old daughter and I to fly to Orlando, Florida to a Kilo 39 Vietnam Veterans Reunion. Mm. I had connected via the internet with some of the men that served with my dad, but I had not met them face to face. They'd invited me to reunions and I chose not to go just because I thought my kids needed me at home. But once Eric bought the tickets, Courtney and I were on our way. One of them by the name of Ray met us at the airport, took us to the reunion. And at that reunion, the men from First Platoon, Zeke, Ray, and Jed, took me under their wing. They too had heard that story, that my dad was killed instantly when the mortar landed on the XO, the CO, and allegedly the senior corpsman. I had no reason to not think that that was accurate, um, except that years prior, around 2000, Ray had connected me to Doc Marty Russell. And I only talked to Doc Russell one time. And that's a regret of mine. I didn't want to upset him. And he seemed like talking about the story of what happened was pretty difficult for him. But in that one conversation, I wrote down every word he said. And Doc Marty Russell said that my dad was alive when the mortars landed. And that my dad helped him treat the XO and the CO. And I couldn't piece together 
how both both couldn't be true. And I didn't know what to do with that. And Doc Russell passed away two years later, so I couldn't call him back. And so I had these two stories existing in my mind. And then I connected with Dan was like Lieutenant of Third Platoon. We connected by email around 2010, but he opened up to me about everything that happened 2019 or so. And Dan Mazzolik said that it was he who was looking at the map with the XO and the CO when the mortar did land basically right in the middle of them. Dan Wazolik jumped down, his words not quite jump in the book, but, but I envision what, as he told me the story that he somehow moved his body down to a, a lower part of the ridge, thus the mortar not hitting him mm. entirely. I'm, I'm sure some fragments, but so, so the person that was supposedly my dad was Dan Wazolik. My dad was senior corpsman. Maybe there was this assumption that he was with the XORCO, but, but he wouldn't have been. There'd be no reason for a corpsman to be looking at a map with the XO and the CO. So then I knew that it was Dan. It wasn't my dad. And so then I had to figure out then where was my dad when all of this was going on? And I talked to Don Carter. And I talked to... The radio man, um, I, I'm sorry, these names are escaping me. They should never escape me. I, I need to find them later. Anyway, I talked to, I, so then, then I talked to the men that were near my dad. And then I went to Vietnam and I still didn't know. I, I, had, I couldn't figure it out. I, I had these accounts. I had these stories. So let's, so, sorry, let me interrupt yeah. you there. So tell me uh, what, what year did you go to Vietnam and what, <laughs> okay, what, perfect. and tell, tell me how that trip came about. How did you? Okay, perfect. Okay. Again, and I don't know why I always said I had to go to Vietnam that one day I was going to go to Vietnam. And so my baby, youngest of five graduated in 2018. So I just set that as the date that I was going to go. I Is knew that, there would be that's Courtney. No, that's Casey. So I have a young son Casey. named Casey. Gotcha. Yeah. So my baby Casey, young son Casey. So I just knew at that point there'd be no more school activity. See, because my dad missed every activity of my life, I couldn't bring myself to miss a single one. Mm. So if my kids were playing soccer, my kids were cheering, I had to be there. And so I didn't want to miss a single minute of their life. I didn't want them to ever feel what I felt of looking up at the stands and having their mom and dad not there. My mom was there, but she was sitting by herself. So I think that wound in me made me know that I couldn't go to Vietnam until they were all graduated. And so I said, December 8th, I said, uh, 2018. And then I had to figure out how to fund the trip. And I had to figure out who was going to go with me. And so I applied for a Lilly faculty scholarship. Now, in order to get the scholarship, I knew I had to do research. They weren't just going to fund me to go to Vietnam. And at that point, I didn't think about, you know, saying that it was for the book. I was just, you know, there was not this in book in my mind. It was all these things in my mind. I had to find out the truth and I had to see it with my own eyes. And so I wrote in that scholarship application that I would do research on the Two Sides Project, which is a organization that puts adult sons and daughters from the U.S. with adult sons and daughters from Vietnam whose fathers fought in the war and were killed. In this incredible organization uh, run by uh, a lady named Margot uh, was, was doing some, they were putting a group together. And so in 2018, December 2018, my dad's battalion surgeon, Dr. Jerry Behrens, his wife, Mary, a nurse who had been to Vietnam 13 times to train Vietnamese nurses, my husband and I met in Vietnam. They flew from Casper, Wyoming. We flew from Indianapolis, Indiana with two purposes. One, to complete the research and two, to climb Valentine's Ridge. You see, when you listen to the accounts of these veterans, 
which way they went up the ridge, where they were. I mean, the stories, I just, I couldn't make sense. They talked about there being two ridges instead of one and it's shaped like a horseshoe. I just had to see it. And so I knew if I could just climb the ridge and see with my own eyes, that I would have a better chance of putting the stories together in a way that was accurate and true. Because all I care about is accurate and true, right? There is no space in my life for anything except the truth about my dad. Because that's all I have. That's all I know, right? Is, is those stories and they have to be accurate and true. And so we went. And that was the hardest 10 days I think I've maybe ever faced. I have a son who was born with Down syndrome. That might have been another one, but it was up there on the list of hard. Um, I don't even think the book did justice to my emotions on that trip. Jerry Barons and Mary were incredible. My husband was incredible. We got to go up the ridge, but we couldn't find a path. We got to have an incredible ceremony where butterflies appeared but I didn't get to see with my own eyes everything that I needed to see. However, in the airport on our way home, Jerry Barron's, I find out, is connected to a man by the name of John Edwards through Facebook. Remember when I talked about Cameron Carter, the man who my dad saved his life along with Doc Russell up on the ridge? When I met Cameron Carter and he told me his story of that day, he gave me an article called Purple Hearts on Valentine's Ridge, an article that had appeared in a newspaper at some point in time. In that article is a man by the name of John Edwards who is quoted. And I thought to myself, if I could just find John Edwards, maybe he knows. But I didn't know how to find John Edwards. Well, how like many I didn't John know Edwards could there be? Good grief. Yeah, exactly. So we're sitting in the airport and Jerry, I think, is on Facebook and, and it's He's messaging something and somehow there's a John Edwards. And so I come home and I find John Edwards on Facebook and John Edwards. Let me do the truth about that story. He passed away this past January, but John Edwards invited me to go with him to Vietnam in July of 2019. Now, keep in mind, I had just been there in December. I really experienced something with my dad in December that I have never experienced before. It was a presence I have never felt. I didn't want to go back really again because I was afraid I wouldn't feel that again. But John Edwards was on Valentine's Ridge. He was a radio comm chief and he volunteered to go on that patrol. And I thought, when am I ever going to have the opportunity to go walk that ridge with someone who was there. And so my son, Casey, had wanted to go with us the first time, but he was in college. So this one happened to be in the summer. And John said to me that we could leave the day after my granddaughter's birthday, because I wasn't going to miss that. And we could go up Valentine's Ridge on my dad's birthday, July the 7th. And so I knew I had to say yes. John Edwards' story, John Edwards' account, talks about seeing a corpsman tending to a Marine that was wearing a radio after the mortars came in. That Marine died and John approached the corpsman to get the radio because he was trying to communicate, get something to communicate back to Kalu. It was I know it was dusk. I, I know that. But John said that he, he was physically like right there with that corpsman. Didn't know them. Didn't know any of them. John wasn't in Kilo. He was, he was a comm chief. But John said that, that as the corpsman helped him take that radio off this Marine who was gone, that the corpsman wept. Now, John told me this story on the telephone in 2019. I called my mom and I said, mom, would my dad have cried and she said yes and I started thinking like I don't know if that was my dad I have no idea but this would have been the first person my dad would have worked on that would have died it it could have been him and so I had to find more people see the story I was told about my dad being killed instantly also led me to believe 
that everybody in the command platoon died. But there were many other people on that ridge near my dad who lived. Their names had never been told to me. I had to find them. So I spent the whole time during COVID, uh, March, uh, my university sent us home. And from March throughout that whole summer until I went back to teaching in the fall, I had this undivided time to pour over all of these accounts and search for more men. Through a group called Buddy Finder, I was able to find some others. And then through Facebook, I found a man named Arthur Sayward, who is the second person who told me he saw my dad's dead body on that ridge, first being Doc Marty Russell, second being Arthur Sayward. And as I put all those accounts together, just like qualitative research classes taught me how to do, I was able, with the help of Jim Lockwood, the Marine from India Company, to look at the accounts of all 10 that died and the five that were MIA and then the five that were KI body not recovered and, and, and sparse those two lists out and then look at the five that were listed as MIA and how were they killed and, and uh, finding a personal account from about each one of them and that only left my dad and Frederick Bungart. I'll never forget the way I felt when it it was like clear to me that Frederick Bungartz had to be the person my dad was, was working on when he was killed. And then Arthur Sayward's story matched up with Doc Russell's. Doc Russell's story from 2000, so many years ago, Arthur Sayward's and Doc Russell's story matched up. And the person wearing the radio was listed as one of the five. It, 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 that my dad really was killed after the mortars trying to save the life of a wounded Marine. I didn't ever expect to know that. I didn't ever, I didn't even expect that that happened. Um, my mom was told he was, that he died instantly, right? Most people would prefer to believe that. He didn't suffer. My story is not what I would have wanted to find, but I know it's true. He was hit by two grenades. He maybe suffered. He maybe knew, I don't know. But the, the truth is, he did what corpsmen are trained to do. He, in the midst of his own self being placed in harm's way, made the choice to try to save the life of one of his Marines. I have learned in writing this book that corpsmen are heroes of immense proportions. I am so proud of my dad. I'd much rather have had him come home. And I know that had he have come home, he wouldn't have been perfect. I know that. But I also know that he deserves nothing less than for his story to be told and for us to strive to live the way that he did and the way that he died. Yeah. Yeah, you mentioned earlier that uh, there were some of the vets you talked to who who hadn't talked about Vietnam, who didn't like to talk about Vietnam, who didn't want to talk about Vietnam, and yet mm -hmm. they were incredibly generous with you. They were. And I, and I think, you know, I wonder if part of that is because I think Vietnam veterans in, in general have a real soft spot for medics and corpsmen. I think you're right. Yeah. I have to say in 2007, when I went to that reunion. I expected to be an outsider. I really was in my own mind. And they treated me like I was one of them. And I did not expect that. I, I, I had no, I had not been around military except for speaking in high schools with some Vietnam veterans. I would tell my dad's story and play his audio tapes with the helicopters, you know, sound up, you know, in, in the background. But other than them, um, you know, a few in my community, my husband designed a monument in our town. So not only did that goal get reached that, you know, get a monument for my dad in Grant County, it was actually designed by my husband. I mean, just, just some really cool things like that have happened. Um, nothing that uh, compares to having him live and get to experience 
other babies and grandchildren and grown old with my mom. I'm not at all saying that any of this makes his death okay. But what I am saying is, it sure seems like um, what my mom told me is true. That, you know, somehow God's will and man's choices intersect together in some way. And if we just look hard enough, we can find joy in living, even with this significant loss. Lori, I just have one, uh, one last question for you. Um, and maybe it's too early, right? Because the, the book hasn't been out that long. Um, so if, if you're not prepared to answer it, maybe, you know, if it's too early, you just let me know. But I do wonder how that the process of having written this book and published this book has changed you fundamentally. How is, you know, and I don't mean just like, how's it changed your life? I mean, how's it changed you? How are you different? Such a good question. Um, I know I shared with you that my mom really kind of devoted her whole life uh, to loving and raising me. And there's no question that um, my husband and I have done the same. But my oldest son said to me, mom, you know, you've always taken care of everyone else. You know, isn't it time you start taking care of you? you know, and I, I'm paraphrasing, right? Um, you know, my second son who lives in DC and I just, the, the love I have for his children, I don't even have words for, right? The same love I have for my oldest son's children who live in Ohio. Um, both of those sons, um, but especially my second son, because he lives so far away, have taught me how critical it is that I, I, I know and accept that I have raised them well, and I, I give myself permission um, to not really think about what they need anymore, right? They are adult, incredible uh, men who are raising children well, and, and my third son is always going to need our help. But my fourth and fifth children, they are also launched. Like they really are doing well. And so what this book has done is it's given me um, satisfaction in focusing on what's next for me in this season of life. I didn't know how to not just keep being a mom. And like, even when I was with my grandkids, sometimes it felt like, like, they were my grandkids, but but like there's just nothing I love more than holding them and being with them. Same way I felt about my own children. But but this book is is really helping other people. The reviews of people saying that this book is impacting their life. It it makes me know uh, that my dad didn't die in vain, regardless of the outcome of that Vietnam War none of those men died in vain. And his legacy has to be carried on through me. And in this next season of life, with whatever opportunities that come to me, I am going to share all of the good that happened as a result of Marty Gibson and Larry Goss falling in love. Uh, before we wrap up, is there anything, is there anything I didn't ask you that you wish I had? I don't think so. Can I give a couple sentences of just, I'm always afraid like somebody's going to listen to it, but like I left them out. Can I do a couple sentences and if you leave them out, it's, it's you instead of me. Is yeah, that fair? Yeah, absolutely. Is that fair to do? Yeah, okay, good. Yeah. Um, This book really has my name on it, but I really have trouble calling it my book. It's easy to call it my dad's book, my mom and dad's book, because that's how I really feel. But the truth is, um, it's also 
for all of our Vietnam veterans. I hope that in the pages, if they choose to read this book, that they find pride in their service, that they know how much we appreciate them and all that they experienced while they were there. This book would not be possible if it wasn't for the veterans, the Vietnam veterans who chose to tell their stories to me. I can't thank them enough. Um, I could list them and I would leave someone out and I would hate that. Um, but they know who they are. And I think they know that they helped this Corman's daughter um, love herself better and really know that uh, her dad would be proud of her as much as she's proud of him. And so to the men of first platoon and second platoon and third platoon of Kela 3-9, I will forever carry you in my heart. And I really pray that this book honors you well uh, and that you know that my dad would be so amazed by all of this. He was a very poor little boy who had big hopes and dreams that all got taken away on that awful day. But I think through all of us, he lives on. And so as we carry out his legacy of love, um, know that I believe we're gonna have this incredible reunion one day in heaven and he's gonna tell you thank you really big.